Hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by the NNINC at the University of Michigan. Before we begin with today's presentation, here are a few housekeeping tips. All participants have been muted in order to avoid background noise. If you have questions, please hold them off till the end of the webinar and we'll have them answered during the Q&A session. You may post your questions using the Q&A tab on your browser window. In the event that we run out of time, and we will get back to your questions via email. This webinar is being recorded and you can view a copy of the same by logging on to the NNINC website in a couple of days. Our representative for today is Dr. Michael Doyle. Uh, he has earned his PhD, Master's and Bachelor's degree at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. He has previously worked with ICA Agrochemicals, BP Central Research and DPX before joining Axel Reed in 2001. His background is in modeling, simulations, statistics and informatics. He has special interest in catalysis, exploration and form formulation tools. Uh, without further ado, over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Parish. Um, again, this is a uh, we're using a voiceover internet protocol for the audio recording, so if this is a little unclear. Um, you know, bear with me. I apologise for that. Today's discussion is about nanotechnology and nanoscience, and there's a lot of uh, aspects of nanoscience and nanotechnology that modeling and simulation and informatics addresses. Um, just starting out thinking about uh, this little graphic that I put together which shows a nanostructured material, um, an oxide layer, and then you know playing bowling with, with, with a, a corporate logo. But it's actually very important. There's a lot of aspects of trying to design, and as we know devices are getting smaller and tinier, trying to design devices so that we can address their nano properties, so that we can use those nano properties. And how we design it is very, very complex. These are things we can't see. These are things we can't, at the component or individual structure level, hold. So I wanted to, to show you a little video that was put together um, by the Intel team. And, and the reason I wanted to show you this was I think all of us are using computers or iPods or iPads or players. And if we think about those chips inside those uh, systems um, and we actually look at them, as we zoom in and we zoom down, modern chip design has gone from the large city type approach where the suburbs have got larger and larger and more uh, buildings have been built further away from the center of the town. And it's gone into the skyscraper design where people are now starting to build systems and at the heart of those systems are electrodes and dielectrics and gates and conduction bands. And within those conduction bands are layered nanostructured material. A gate electrode, a dielectric and a semiconducting layer. And so the whole point about showing you that video was I wanted to put into context that this nano design is not just about esoteric things. It's actually about things that matter very much and that make the cell phones that you all have today and you hold in your hands smaller. The other point is it's a very active field. Sure, there has been uh, the usual sort of hype cycle that's gone on with nanotechnology and nanoscience. They, it's grown up, it's become very, very highly funded, and then it's somewhat retrenched. But now is the point where people are starting to do extremely interesting science. So these are just some of the current publications in the current literature looking at nanostructured materials where people are trying to understand things as, as diverse as catalysts, which are used in water shift reactions and fissiotropes, which is part of the whole biomass remediation catalyst activity, all the way through looking at magnetic properties and looking up to things like the hydrogen economy and storing hydrogen onto metal alloys and metal layers. The methods that people use to address these challenges, although we're talking about nano devices, span a range of attributes. They go from quantum, where we look at reactivity and chemical reactions and accurate thermodynamics, through configurational or structural at the molecular level and the lattice or surface level, through mesoscale, where people start to investigate self-organized nanostructure, and then to the finite element. And the technology that I've spent the last 25 years, 24 years working with is in those bottom three brackets. That is to say, from the quantum, through the molecular, through the mesoscale. 
Finite element is a somewhat logical extension of this. But if you think about it, we go from figuring out where all the electrons are, we approximate those as a set of springs, and then we approximate those springs as a set of beads or, or sphericals, and then we approximate those as an element in a bulk scale. So the sets of simulations are connected both conceptually and in a parametric input and output sense. The sort of areas that people look at across boundaries are inorganic, organic, and biological, trying to understand uh, crystal cell assemblies, trying to understand how those assemblies relate to laboratories where people manage information and informatics from differential scanning calorimetry all the way through atomic force microscopy. And on the other hand, they add value to those tests and they add information to them by quantum mechanically predicting spectra by, from molecular dynamics predicting deformational behavior from mesomechanics predicting testing and phase aggregation or phase separation behavior or dissolution, i.e., if I functionalize my nanotube, does it dissolve into my polymer or does it spend a lot of time as a powder clumping together? Because that's one of the big challenges with nanostructured materials is avoiding clumping, avoiding aggregation, avoiding mixing and demixing effects. So the benefits of, of the virtual simulation is pretty simple. It's designed before you buy, designed before you build. It allows you to investigate ideas, i.e. if I put my functionalized spaces for solubility onto my fiber at a certain spacing, does it improve it? Can I polyfunctionalize that? Can I have a second effect? Can I make it more compatible with another component in my mixture? Can I understand what's actually happening since I know these tubes do dissolve or do interact, right? Can I understand what that interaction is and can I start to tailor it or can I look at what the effect of elements within my, my tube or my tube wall? They allow me to understand how I could change an existing system to improve it. That is the incremental stepwise development, the stepwise understanding and again, to understand if I get an observation or an experiment, does that fit a trend that's been observed historically or is it outside that trend and scope? And of course, it allows me to share information with people I'm working with, with colleagues. The, the sorts of insights are about new functions, new materials, new insights, as I said, polyfunctional and increasing scope because one of the things you can do with a, a simulation method and has been done in many cases is screen alternatives. Now, we all know that there may be a baseline in that. There may be some inaccuracy due to the scope of the simulation you're using, the size of the cell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, and this is very, very key, a simulation approach has a consistent baseline. It's called the algorithm. It's called the parameter set that it's using. If you do experiments across multiple research teams, across different diverse institutes, sometimes there's a baseline shift. I, for the beginning of my career, was involved in the IUCR, the International Unit of Crystallography, round robin tests for understanding baseline of crystal structures because there were differences between universities in England and universities in Europe and universities in America, even doing the same materials. Modeling actually provides a more consistent software basis for that that's not got the human variance and element. So that can be used to both understand broad bases of systems that couldn't be addressed experimentally, to give some idea of experiments that are not worth doing, and sometimes provide that unique or interesting insight. The methods that can be approached from this sort of technology are things like energetics, right? are things like dynamics. So energetics gives us, as I said before, heat. My molecules absorbing on my surface there in the bottom right. Dynamics, looking at those two layers in, and the tribological effect of the nano level or nano engineering of the molecules, understanding how if I functionalize that surface or I change the composition or the nature of the interlayer, how I affect it. Now that was actually a very active area of nanomaterials research, looking at nanotribology for um, large disk arrays and hard disk manufacturing. With the advent of solid state devices and memory devices, that is now actually falling out of an area of active research, but it's still important. Understanding structural surface construction, surface effects, the quantum dot in the top right, 
interfaces, adhesion, laminates, delamination effects, binding. So I have my wonderful super strength bucky tube, but now I need to incorporate it into my tennis racket. I need to incorporate it into my bicycle frame, etc. And then self-evidently things like electrical conductivity across semiconductors, across nano or semiconducting tubes, and the heat transfer that occurs in these materials. So, nanomaterials, two important aspects. One, are size-dependent properties. They're so small that they have unique semi-quantum level effects uh, and can influence an application because of that. And the second is that there are collective properties of ordered array. Think of quantum dots. These allow us to have photonic emission, whereas individual elements would not necessarily contribute, but the group aggregate and the spatial arrangement of an aggregate drives that application and that function. So those are the two areas that people are really interested in understanding design about. One is, I'm going so small that I have to consider quantum effects. I cannot just use my traditional finite element bulk approximations. And number two, even at the next step up from that micro design aspect, I have arrangements which again have interactions which affect quantum level behaviors. Okay. If we think about this, there are two details. This was laid out by Richard Feynman even in the 1950s. There's top down, right? I try and modify an existing material and sculpt it and change it and modify it. things like lithography, punching holes in surfaces. Um, I think about scaling integrated circuits. It's, it's tricky because it is not a very scalable solution. It is a, for want of a word, a, a brute force solution. Take something, knock holes in it, see what happens to the, the observable properties. The other alternative is bottom up. That is by using atoms through sputtering or elements or things like language logic and self-assembling layered films to construct entities and then maybe doing something like a lithography removal to change the distribution of those entities, but to build those up at a fundamental level and then use the nature of chemistry and self-assembly to render the final structure. It's very efficient from a scaling standpoint because it is cheap, it is defect tolerant. If you have the right chemistry, you can run chemistry very effectively. The problem with that is that it's very difficult to do. And doing atom placement or molecule placement just by dint of uh, forces such as Van der Waals electrostatic uh, London dispersion forces makes it uh, a challenge. So to construct something like this diagram, that I'm showing you now where I have rendered holes within a lattice material and I'm using this to try and understand photonic emissions and absorption effects in this material is a challenge, but it can be done. Top-down design, there's a range of these. You know, AFMs have been used traditionally a while to move atoms around on surfaces. We're all aware of the various uh, images that Don Eigler, Eigler did, the IBM team writing IBM many years ago. Um, and there's also things like soft lithography, right, where people print down onto uniform monolayers by basically squashing molecules out of the way or moving them out of the way. They change the distributions and the layer. Those are top-down approaches. Bottom-up, well, bottom-up are now starting to look at self-assembly or induced assembly of things like DNA. So there's a whole area where by controlling the distribution of uh, base pairs in DNA, you can actually build shapes, topologies, arrangements. You can construct, and has been done, smiley faces. You can construct pyramids and triangles. You can construct inverted columns or columns which have branches with pyramids on each end. There's a range of, of, um, of elements can be built, and those are driven by the DNA-DNA base pairing interactions. Different structures can be built that have different arrangements and can be constructed. So, the types of properties are mechanical, electronic, thermal, magnetic, and catalytic. Right? And the whole aspect of nanoscale design is tunability. And the whole aspect of modeling, simulation type work is understanding that tunability and scoping it 
and defining the boundaries, the limits, and the areas of that tunability. The sorts of things that people are doing, and I'll try and go through some of those with you and some of the industrial sort of examples of those. Things like next generation tube computer chips are using nano interconnects because they're smaller, because they have higher conductivity or selective conductivity. There's a huge amount of work going on, as we all see now, with laser pointers and LED street lights and OLED displays and cell phones in light emitting and electron emitting devices. Right, improving the light emission characteristics of these as well as providing flexibility for perhaps what we may see later this year in flexible wrist watches from Apple or other vendors is a key industrial driver of research into this area and understanding quite how color and stability and performance can be improved and things like mechanical resistance improved is a huge area. Structural materials. Um, Although there have been some interesting uh, steps in composite aircraft, and I'll come to that later, structural materials which provide very high strength to weight ratio, right, improved fatigue, lower fuel and fossil fuel consumption to propel them, or hopefully more hybrid-like propulsion systems, whether those are using batteries or compressed gases, etc., are a, a must for society as it goes forward. And talking of those vehicles and those hybrid-like vehicles, energy conversion and storage. Fuel cells, where there are catalysts that are involved in the anode-cathode reaction in the molecular separation and controlling the diffusion of uh, hydroxonium ions and, and protons through things like natrium polymer membranes are important. Long-life lithium-ion batteries, right? In, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a travesty to ha perhaps consider that most batteries in computers, phones, tablets, lithium ion based systems, lithium polymer based systems are at best 70%, 75% efficient, right? Just because of the stoichiometry, we know they can never be 100% efficient, and so we're wasting weight. We can probably do better with the science and understand a better engineered system than they, those are. Solar cells, photovoltaic materials, and then, as I, I've said and I'll say again, things like ultra capacitors, which don't require a chemical reaction to provide energy very rapidly, but have, because of their nature, limits on the amount of energy storage. Those are a challenge area that we see people starting to look at nanoengineering capacitors building more surface onto a surface by using crenellations. Uh, based on nanostructured materials. Obviously catalysts, zeolite catalyst cracking has been around for many decades. It is fundamentally a nano-engineered system. It's basically a refinery in a pore inside a silicon framework. It allows chemical reactions to occur. It controls chemical reactions. It has shape selectivity, etc. Medical implants. There's been a number of papers recently, uh, and Bob Langer in Boston has done a huge amount of work constructing polymer scaffolds for growing skin tissue for both cosmetic and medical replacement reasons. And on the flip side, doing nanoengineering of materials to do controlled drug localized dilution where administration of the drug through a normal oral mechanism would be highly toxic to the individual, but a brain cancer could be treated by a localized implant with basically a, a small wafer disc that is a nanostructured polymer system, which because of the tortuosity and the porosity within that polymer um, controls the rate of elution of the drug substance and basically keeps it to a localized region within the brain or in the skull of, of the child involved. Heart valves is another area with a growing population where because of uh, the consumption of things like liquid uh, silicon based antacids, there are difficulties with conventional replacement mechanisms and understanding how we can coat, how we can improve the mechanics of those systems how we can possibly do tissue re-engineered versions of those systems rather than conventionally uh, using ones culled from, from animals uh, is a very important area. Finally, we get into things like sensors, uh, where people are currently in, in, in the current political climate very concerned about sensors, gas sensors, material sensors, but in a general sense, wastewater streams, outlets of plants, understanding uh, the food that we consume and monitoring that, these are important. And then obviously, 
there are things like targeted drug delivery, as I mentioned earlier. Some of the examples of people doing work are people like publications with a Mitsubishi, who do a lot of work in lithium-ion batteries, right? They want to understand how changing chemistries, how changing the electrolyte that's coated onto the graphite and lithium-ion system can affect it. And that coating is a very complex layer of multiple materials, things like lithium carbonate, lithium oxide, lithium fluoride, uh, polyolefins, um, all of those and the domain distribution and how they work affect the performance of the battery. How do they do this? Well, one aspect of this is they construct multiple chemical entities and look at their electrostatic, electronic, and functional response and how those map to the domain space. So this isn't necessarily a distribution analysis. This is about property analysis of nano or micro or atomistically engineered materials. If we think about a company like a semiconductor like Taiwan Semi, these people spend a lot of time trying to understand interfacial regions. I remember once talking to someone about amorphous silicon, and they asked me a very simple question. They said, Michael, how many atoms do I have to move before I can't tell it's crystalline? before I actually see it as an amorphous material. Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it in a cluster? What happens if I do it? And so we just spent some time literally simulating electron diffraction and X-ray scattering patterns, starting with a crystalline lattice and then randomly removing or moving, two sets of experiments, different percentages and different distributions of atoms till we basically, with the resolution instruments available at that point, couldn't tell. And it was all about understanding the amorphous interlayer region, where we have an amorphous deposited silicon material, we have a crystalline silicon material, what happens in between? Now if we roll on a few years, we've actually started looking at how valence bands and conduction bands become offset and trying to understand the charge distribution across those bands. And so as you see here, we start with a very small sectional simulation, but we actually move up to a larger layered one, where at the bottom we have pure crystalline silicon, at the top we have silicon oxide, in the middle we have an offset layer. And we start to understand how that affects the band structure between the semiconductor, the metal oxide, and the interface layer, right? And how that affects the electronic performance and properties of the material, right? So the layer is mapped to the microstructural model, and then the properties and the densities of states are mapped to the macroscopic observable behavior. Another area, I said I'd talk a little bit about it in nanostructured materials and composites and how you think about functionalizing, right? People make new generations of aeroplanes. The desire of these is very clear and very obvious. Reduce fuel consumption, reduce carbon footprint, improve net profitability, perhaps for people operating them. Uh, this is actually a picture from the, the Boeing magazine uh, a number of years back when they started on the idea of polymer simulation and understanding how to maintain, bond, clean, repair. Just consider this. If you build a carbon fiber aircraft, now you have to service that. If someone scratches it or scrapes it or bangs a suitcase into it, now you actually have to service that in an airport. And it may depend, or on a field, it may depend whether that's in northern United States, right, up in Michigan, or whether it's down in Texas. Right? The temperature may be different. So the sort of repair that you have to do may be subtly and somewhat strangely different. And that involves a lot of nano and micro engineering to understand how that adhesive works and what it does. Obviously, as we move to things like the Dreamliner and people starting to look at what is happening in these lithium-ion batteries and why are they having certain problems, a detailed understanding of the chemistry, of what causes chemical breakdown, of the consequences of chemical degradation and interactions are very important and critical to the micro-scale work. And, and that engineering problem is being and has been partially addressed by a combination, as we can read, of macroscopic experimentation, microscopic investigation, and microscopic design. Okay. Other areas is not in the design of the semiconductor material or in the design of the composite, but in gluing them together. 
uh, you may not have thought about this, but chips in our phones, in our computers, generate a lot of heat, right? We all have heat sinks, we all can feel them, how they blow out hot air. One of the biggest sources of failure in those systems is shear. The chip expands because of its heat generation at a different rate to the underlying circuit board or backing. Therefore, you have stress. Therefore, these hundreds, many hundreds of pins that are used to anchor and communicate and pass signals from the motherboard to the chip and vice versa become horizontally or diagonally stressed. And they shear off, or they crack, or they deform. And that causes a failure. So encapsulation, nano-encapsulation of these, encapsulation where we can tune, remember that word tune I used earlier, the coefficient of thermal expansion, the viscous flow effect, so I completely underfill rather than just sort of ending up with gloop around the edges like a meniscus, right, is very important. And is very critical to basically stabilizing that chip on the substrate and producing a device that has nice performance over time. And so when it's in your pocket, when it's walking from a car to a building, out in the winter outside, your phone doesn't fail. And it's quite important and quite essential. The area that's interesting with this is there's a whole bunch of simulation that can be done. Things stuck on surfaces, things between the encapsulated material and the copper and the copper and the copper oxide, because it's not just a single layer. It's not just a pure uh, edge terminated surface. The important aspect of this is taking that information and presenting it to engin engineers and designers and people doing formulation work. And that's a very important area for ourselves, Accelerus, where we take that science and we deploy it into web pages, which are easily disseminatable, easily communicatable, and provide a very democratized access point to that complex and detailed science and scientific workflows. If you think about flexible displays, I mentioned them earlier. There's one from Sony. Um, there's a huge amount of materials engineering in here. These systems are actually a combination of bottom-up and top-down design. There are printed layers of printing the material onto the flexible display. There are also functional monolayers and functional assemblies where interfacial engineering is deliberately managed to actually allow us to understand the step from the HOMO through to the continuum vacuum layer and where the electrons go. A similar thing happens in things like Grapsel cells, where the dye pigment molecules, which have been attached to titanium dioxide surfaces, are specifically engineered to have charge separation under photon excitation so that the electrons flow to the surface. Now, Grapsel cells are a very interesting area because the driver for the nano-engineering of those has been economic. Titanium dioxide, widely available, ubiquitous material in industrialized world. Can we use that to help us generate energy to alleviate a lot of dependence on things like fossil fuels and for remote areas where there's no avail availability of those or very little availability? Yes. Does it work well as a native material? No, nowhere near. So how can we help? Well, we, we coat it with specifically designed pigments. We can improve that efficiency. We can make a system that if it uses a generally available type of pigment, something that's used for other printing aspects, right, or is a slight, very subtle modification of one of those, is cheap, is simple to produce, can then be grafted onto a bulk material easily with a simple production process, and thereby allow us to actually start addressing third world or underdeveloped region energy requirements, for instance, just providing cooling for vaccines, just providing the ability to store milk or other materials for longer than a daily basis to remove the need to have a daily trek to go and find those materials. Right? Using Garaxel cells is one approach to that. The key point is, as I said, designing something that uses a relatively off-the-shelf commercial pigment that uses a simple attachment or modification process and works well. And being able to design those, which is sort of the reverse of things like organic light emitting photo materials, right, or thin film transistor materials that are organic light emitting, very interesting. Of course, there's the other side that they'll start putting things like RFID tags into flexible things. So they'll be incorporated into clothing, perhaps allowing people then to walk up to their favorite computer and to have a, a bi-directional communication without having to necessarily do all of the work that they uh, want to do by keying in information. 
When you start to look at other aspects, if you think about uh, pentacenes and pentacene nanoengineering in displays, there's actually, this is a, a picture of a, a very interesting display, which is a, a next generation um, light emitting structure. Um, the problem simply is that there are dropouts, that these systems where you start to incorporate multiple uh, pentacene rings and multiple coated pentacene systems within the element emitting the light fails. And being able to nano design those and to do the chemical modifications and understand as we move through K space how the energy varies is a very important aspect. Okay, so I've talked about industrial interests. I've talked about why, basically, from a society standpoint. Obviously, there are a few little technical aspects. Building carbon nanotubes can be chiral, non chiral. They can have a differential offset as you slice or think of cutting a nanotube out of a graphene or graphite sheet. That is actually a graphite sheet. The types of things that you can construct, you can construct multi-wall tubes. So you can ask the question, if I have three layers, four layers, five layers, what happens? If the layers are offset, if the middle layer is chiral versus non-chiral, what happens? I can start to understand the distribution, the van der Waals, the dimensions, the size, shape of that pore. I can start to ask questions about electronic conduction and iron mobility down that pore, or material mobility. Next size of, of nanoengineering is things like clusters, where I can take basic cubic monoclinic lattices, structural lattices of, of a general type, and I can embed into them concentrations and gradients and layers of material. And clusters can be built from things that aren't just regular repeating what you would consider conventional lattices. They can be built from things like amorphous polymers. And so we can look at edge sphere effects, perimeter effects, center effects, distribution effects. Ultracapacitance, something I said, I believe, because of the ability to provide energy very, very quickly and to regenerate energy quite quickly in an automobile sense, uh, is an interesting area. How do you make capacitors work more? You can't wind them much tighter. You can't decrease the separation between the layers much more than you currently do with materials. The way you do it is, as I show here in the top left, you make the, you make the surfaces fuzzy. You make them hairy. You increase the surface area by having many, many, many quantum level whiskers. And those can be used to store charge. And that's how you suddenly go from having meters or square meters of surface to having square kilometers of surface. And that's where you get the capacity up. And that is how you'll be able to then have your car have instant power available rather than having to rely on some sort of chemical battery or fuel cell conversion to do it. Conduction and connection of things like nanotubes is a very interesting area. Uh, this diagram down here by Paul McEwen, where we talk about two nanotubes crossing over um, and the effects on them. Everyone's used to that sort of image of seeing the two sets of gold interconnect and the nanotubes between it. But what they don't think about is in the B and C figures, does that change the nature of the nanotubes? And as we change the nature of the nanotubes, that is to say we have deformation and, and compression, do we start to change the conductive properties? So if we draw the wires too tight, if we drop the wires onto each other too much, does that affect our ability to conduct? And when we're thinking about atom insertion and printing uh, these systems down, we then start to ask the question, can we have iron migration? Can we use uh, these tubes to actually drive photonic emission? Can we actually build uh, systems where we have iron insertion nanotubes? And can we understand what's actually happening? Do these things damage the nanotubes? Do they cause structural rearrangements? How do metal ions migrate down those? By using Virtual simulation methods, you can gain insights into what is happening and how these occur and why they occur. There are other types of, of nanostructured devices. Um, I, uh, as was introduced, started out part of my career in the exploration field. There, things like cyclodextrins are used as anti-foaming agents. They cut down foam when you've got cleaning fluids being used or pumped around large amounts of, of oil wells. Um, the problem 
recyclodextrins are. They're, they're complex and sometimes a little bit tricky to manage. In this application, because they're bucket shaped, right, they're sort of like a, an atomistic pail, trash can, you can use them to do some very interesting effects. You can thread them literally, like a, like someone would do with a with a needle, onto a fiber. And once you have the concept of a molecular necklace, you can then use chemistry because of all these OH groups hanging off them, the glucose units, to cross-link and to build scaffold assemblies, and then get rid of your polymer chain. Now, does that actually work? Yes, this is an FM image that shows us a molecular wire, right, layer down to mica, and we can actually look at the size of it. The question is, can we build these, and when we build them, how do they assemble? Is there a preference for going head, tail, head, tail? Is there a preference for going tail to head, and then just becoming all pointing the same direction? So in the second, uh, second layer here, you see that I have uh, basically mirror images, or reversed uh, cyclodextrins. Now, why is that happening? Can I change it? Can I functionalize the cyclodextrin to mean that it's easier to crosslink, or that they all assemble in the same orientation? And if I do that, does that affect their ability to assemble on my polymer backbone, as you see in the bottom diagram? Right? And there's a whole series of results that can be done here. When we look at what happens to the polymer chain, is there an enforced conformational templating on the polymer chain? Does that affect the, the, the docking and the absorption? And how does that affect what the rather energetics of that? And is there a charge transfer effect? Does this affect our conductive or our colligative properties? And how does that occur? Other types of nanotubes. Well, I've mentioned things like boron nitride uh, nanotubes before. But these actually have some interesting questions, because they're not just pure, standard, regular 6.6 or 10.10 uniform nanotubes, you can start to look at other structures, such as caps, such as claws, such as spear structures, and to understand how those affect, sometimes dramatically, the charge, electronics, and mechanical aspects. What about spintronics? In organometallic chemistry, you're used to understanding metal chelated systems, Kamansky class 1, class 2, metallocene, zirconocene, for example, catalysts can be built. How can those be put inside a tube? And what does that do for us? Well, there's been a lot of work that's been going on about spintronics. And this has been done for both memory and communication and high-speed data transfer aspects. Being able to look at that, being able to understand the transport characteristics of metallocenes inside nanotubes and how we can design and modify those, both by changing the pendants or the substituents on uh, the pentacene ring, but then looking at functionalizing on the nanotube, is a very, very complex and interesting area. Field emission devices. I already talked about it from a pentacene side. In this side, there was a lot of work done in understanding why uh, capped nanotubes, which have good field emission characteristics and are a strong potential field emission system fail very badly or have distinct challenges in the high humidity and water environments. And what it comes down to is water molecules absorb, these are idealized representations, right, onto the surface of those caps. Right? And they have a whole series of binding energies and you can understand how that perturbs the electronics and the electronic levels and the systems. Okay. I talked about mechanical duress. This is about that. This is looking at nanomechanics, taking uh, carbon pure nanotubes, deforming them, deforming them through angles of kink, let us say, or angles of twist, but understanding as we do that, or as we do that with a, a block to simulate a, an external mechanical agent, how does that affect the conduction, right? And does that actually affect the conduction effects and the bias effects on the various bending angled driven tubes, right? So at the end of the day, what this shows is the 
change in the band offset and the change in the uh, conduction can be mirrored and measured experimentally and is a very, very interesting piece of work. When we're talking about synthesis of materials, such as metallic alloys, right, zinc sulfide, for example, here, we can actually look at these and look at melting and then amorphization and recrystallization effects with atomistic and nanoscale simulation methods. And the reason for starting with a baseline system of understanding a simple metal alloy, sulfide like this, is because then we can start to ask the question as we get into two phases, what happens when we take cerium oxide and a mixed titanium cerium oxide, what goes where if we melt them into co-melt them or co-recrystallize them? Do things go onto the surface? Do things go into the bulk? And what happens with those systems? And when we do that crystallization, do we get phase segregation? So we get a core of, that is regular and an outer shell that is element enriched that is amorphous. And can we then modify that distribution or tailor it specifically to our performance characteristics such as mechanical and electrical performance? Okay. The other aspect of that, which is very interesting, is when you incorporate dopants into these systems, you start to get shape change. Not only do you get phase segregation as they recrystallize, but now you start to get uh, spherical units, polyhedral units, right? Those polyhedral units show faceting, and the faceting can be reflected by experiment calculation. So as I said at the beginning of this discussion, uh, a lot of the initial work is about understanding how we engineer atomistic groups and atomistic sections. In the last uh, five to 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about graphene and a little bit about nanocatalysis, right? Everyone knows that graphene is, is a potentially new advanced material. Monolayers give us huge uh, anisotropic strength protection. They also have significant electrical conducting properties. All right? And the questions about how if you have defects within graphene layers, because the various mechanisms for making graphene systems uh, all create defects, right? So whether we're talking about chemical degradation, or whether we're talking about thermal pyrolysis degradation, um, or layering or mechanical, you know, sticky tape and pulling off layers off the surface, all of these create some level of defects. When we start looking at functionalization, atoms go to the defect sites preferentially sometimes. They have structural effects. They can even start to unzipper it, just like the conventional uh, zipper that you would have in a clothing garment, right? And so what people can start to do is to take graphene layers. Um, this is actually some work done uh, in the UK at the London Centre for Nanotechnology. And they can look at intercalation or surface incorporation of those, right? And they can look at understanding hydrogens, hydrogen incorporation, looking where that affects electron density, understanding how different systems or different mimetics of the system um, can reproduce the absorption barriers, and then to take that and move towards a tunable work function. So now we can look at a photo-driven change system and look at the engineering of that based on the attributes. Right? Of course, that allows us to then address things like separation uh, and the storage of electron withdrawing, electron affecting groups within that. Nanoreactors and catalysts, well, as I said, it, this has been around for a while from an application and industrial usage standpoint. And there's been a lot of papers published historically on this. But as we move into now starting to look at how we process biomass, how we separate what we do in a biological or modified biological organism versus what we do in a plant and trying to understand how we can shift that balance based on economic need, based on local supply, right? You get some very interesting questions 
to be asked. And this has driven a resurgence in, of work in things like zeolites, ZSM5, etc. What is the mechanism of chemistry? How is that affected by the distribution around it? How is that affected by my ring size? And can I look at these and look at how these things crystallize from a hydrothermal synthesis and build these rings? Do we assemble the small rings first or the large rings first? These are questions that have gone on for many years and are very challenging and interesting. Being able to do this is difficult because if we look at the chemical reactivity, which is what we wanted to focus on, we have a very, very large simulation. If we look at the mechanical, Newtonian mechanics around that, we have a lack of resolution of the chemistry. And so what people want to do is to trade off a very long simulation for something that's more practical, and frankly, where they can screen multiple results to look at differential effects. And what they want to do is to use a quantum shell within which you then have a within which you have the reactivity and outside which you have the mechanical embedding effects. And this just shows you active research that people are doing as to what is the size of that shell that has to be done to do this. If we think about core level spectroscopy for these materials, right? It's it's well known that if I know where the atoms are and electrons are, I can start to calculate things like electron energy loss spectroscopy and core hell core hole excitation. This then allows us to understand how, if we're looking at uh, materials like gallium oxide, um, we're looking at phosphate-derived materials, we can modify those and tailor those. And we can look at, I don't know if that's animating well on the screen, but different vibrational modes in materials and understand their impact and the characteristic as those materials age or go through repeated cycles of regeneration and reactivation. So again here, um, we're using technology to understand are the absorption effects giving us bridging, bidentate, unidentate, and then the next step of that is to then say, right, rather than having a uniform surface, I can now do functional engineering and design on that surface. The last aspect I want to talk about is doing screening of complex metallocenes. I mentioned these are used as catalysts. As you see here, there's a range of calculations that can be performed and a range of derivative structures that can be analyzed within that. Okay. These then allow us to look at separation. This is nanoengineering. This is deliberately tailoring the pendant groups and the structural groups around my ruthenium complex, my active center, to give us an antimeric selection of the polymer to give us understanding. Now, we can do even better than that because then, as I've shown earlier on the spintronics case, these can then be incorporated into large bore or medium bore nanotubes, and that gives us a further degree of flow diffusion control. Okay. And so you can validate these. The final area is nanotomisa. Why is this important? Well, there's a whole series of different uh, effects that people want out of a nanoengineered system, right? That are actually manifest at the phase and meso scale. Um, if you think about the soap bubbles that you got in your shampoo when you washed your hair this morning. Those surfactants are atomistically engineered nanomaterials. The way they're distributed, the way they're delivered, the phase distribution within which they are manufactured is a piece of nanostructural engineering. Right? The attributes of those as the effect cleaning can also be engineered. For cleaning, there's a form it cleans, it doesn't clean. When you're now talking about understanding the absorption rate of a drug substance as it passes through the intestine, as it moves into the stomach or, or, the, or the gut wall, how that can be done, where that happens, how that affects its distribution in the body and its PKPD type behavior relative to a population and different genotypes is more interesting and more exciting to me. So phase separation, phase structure, which can influence does my nanofiber 
clump or does it spread out into my polymer? Does it actually have the right interfacial adhesion? Does it, the fact that I've built this wonderful matrix composite, just tear away at the edges? Those are very, very important. And the sorts of calculations and work that people do in the nano field are, are the following. They do things like interfacial tension, understanding the change in composition, how that affects interfacial tension observable, understanding stress, stress sensors, can I compress it, can I shear it, can I pull it, right, understanding things like bulk viscosity, what happens if I introduce my new component, does it become unpumpable, unspreadable, right? And then we get down to things like temperature dependence and miscibility, critical micelle concentration, understanding diffusivity, and understanding the distribution of chains and end-to-end distances. What is coarse graining? Well, it's just this logical step. It's taking a polymer, an atomistic, a ball and stick representation, just making bigger beads, right? Why is that important? Well, as you construct a bead representation, it allows you to go to very long length scales. And you know, I started out this talk by, by representing to you that there was detail in the quantum, detail in the structural, detail in the mesal, detail in the mesoscale, and then finally the area of finite element. Well, mesoscale representation allow us to get from the chemical reactive field and the structural field all the way up to the area of mechanical and phase distribution and time lengths. Okay. How those are built? Well, you construct parametric representations from your smaller scale app simulations and then you pack them and then you might have a system like we here on the left which is a template for a, a micelle absorbing onto a skin or drug diffusion, or interestingly for things like hair penetration and colorant absorption into dye or lipstick absorption. And on the right, we're starting to look at the assembly of buckyballs or functionalized pegylated uh, drug substance units in between a water and a barrier membrane to look at a transdermal delivery system. So there's a lot of maths involved in this and dissipative particle dynamics. Why? Because by doing engineering, at the atomistic level, which affects the interaction, the mean field interaction potentials, I can then understand whether I have a B in an A matrix, an A in a B matrix, hexagonal phases, bicontinuous phases, or lamellar phases, right? And that comes back to where we started with fuel cells, because things like nafion, things like drug elutions control systems, all of these have tortuous networks that are represented by different distributions of phases and the elements, whether they be charged species, whether they be active drug substances, diffuse through those mazes. So it's actually using atomistic control to design the tortuosity network to control the physical properties. For example, it's sort of like trying to say, I'm going to build a hedgerow maze to have a certain effect and to make people go on a certain route, and I'm going to do that by controlling the plant growth and the seed time. It's that sort of question and challenge. Okay. But if it's done right, you can clearly understand the distribution and you can start to gain insight as to how those systems can be taken from what has been serendipitously found and created as a structural system. You can then optimize them and produce them more effectively and efficiently. And you can start to look at things like dendritic systems, right, and how those work and how those affect things like elastic moduli and structural moduli within the space. So, in summary on the catalysis, we can start to look at things like this. We can understand the support, support interactions to active materials, which are very important and, and are frankly often overlooked. We can understand particle size and the effect of particle size distributions and spatial aggregates of those particles. We can look at structural morphology of those we can understand coverage, we can look at things like promoters and poisons and solutions. So, in summary, the whole of the nanoengineering area is, as we discussed right at the beginning, a combination of microstructural effects and macrostructural effects. Right? It's about linking 
unique size-dependent properties which simulation can give you a handle on, and collective array-based properties on orders and understanding the consequence of those. It's also about linking the two together so that the array-based properties may be driven and governed by the detailed properties and the structures. And that is what people use and do to focus on applications and their needs and to satisfy what they have to do. It's also an area that people can research into and there's a huge amount of science and a huge amount of opportunity for people to try and understand these and understand the differences between systems. I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions in the last few minutes uh, and I'll thank you all for your time and your attention. Thank you, Michael. Uh, do we have questions, please? Okay, uh, we have one question, mm -hmm. uh, and it reads, uh, thank you very much for the very nice presentation. You spoke about various applications and examples, but there was very little on the various modules of Material Studio and how sure, they can sure. be used to solve many of the examples that you mentioned. Will that be a topic for a future webinar? Yes, absolutely. We can talk through uh, the applications from Material Studio. I was trying to make this less of a... Uh, an industrial pitch as it were but um, those actually are Material Studio brings together a range of technologies right um, this slide that I'm just moving to now <coughs> really ad directly addresses how Material Studio can work so within Material Studio there's a series of simulation engines right um, these simulations ra engines range from uh, quantum mechanical, right, through to um, through to atomistic, force field based, um, through to mesoscale and macro scale. There are a series of, and I'll just actually pop it up and show you them very quickly so everyone understands what I'm talking about, right, um, right. So, for example, this is a Material Studio, very fast in three minutes, right? There are a series of modules. The modules range from things such as amorphous cell construction that allows us to take molecules and construct amorphous assemblies, three-dimensional lattice assemblies, through to interfaces and application capabilities around CASTEC, which is a Cambridge Analytical Total Energy Package, i.e. it's a plane wave density functional quantum code through to our type binding code DFTB plus that allows us to look at semi parameterized DFT right where we have some of the core electrons basically parameterized out through to DMOL which is a full cone sham density functional periodic or molecular with dynamics code uh, we also have foresight which is our premium premier energy force field calculation tool and that allows people and I can show you in a second but to construct molecules and atom arrays and then when I'm doing energy to pick a range of force field types right there's also capacity in material studio for bringing in new force fields as text files or by doing parametric editing of existing force fields so there's tools for doing that and then we get down to things like there's an interface to Gaussian Gulp, which is a core shell code, which allows us to look at polarization effects and a very, very large range of physical properties of systems. And so it has, again, a range of different parametric force field types, as you see here, from things such as, uh, you know, Max uh, Davenport, May Davenport force fields through to Catlow force fields. Um, and to compute ranges of different properties within those lattices, frequencies, potentials, electronic field gradients. And on the other side, we have technologies like that, which is a vectorized, uh, the Austin model package, 
which allows us to calculate UV vis spectra, localized orbitals, frequencies, uh, etc. One last thing I didn't actually give full credit to. Uh, CASTEP, right, allows us to look at electron energy densities, differences, IR spectra, NMR, optical properties, right, there's a list, it just goes on and on and on. Material Studio is a single user interface, it's a consistent user interface, it allows us to very rapidly go in and construct molecules, right, molecular entities like this, Right, which is a trivial entity of, 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 of not much complexity. But it also allows us to do things like construct block copolymers, right, where I might just add a, a series of blocks, uh, a series of functional groups, right, and when I've done those, uh, repeat uh, that uh, three times, and that builds me a polymer chain, right, so that is my polymer chain as you see here. Obviously, I have the ability to do displays, to modify displays, to change displays and entities. And Material Studio is quite smart because it actually allows us, if I take a molecule such as this and I run a calculation such as a vectorized AMPAC calculation, a very quick semi-empirical electrostatic property calculation, it takes that molecule, it creates a duplicate as you see on my left hand side, it creates a folder structure that preserves it, it can pass the job off to a remote server, so I can actually have remote server management between my local laptop that I'm running on, and calculation is finished, any other server gateways that are running the server code, um, and then when I get that back self-evidently, I can do the analysis. A lot of the codes here are uh, parallelized, Right, and support HPMPI, right, so there's an orbital calculation. So for example, if I'm running a calculation with CASDEP, I have job control and I can run it on multiple cores and I can pick the gateway and I can specify if there is a queue. Uh, uh, um, and that's some of the areas that the technology has because the choice of cores, well you might think just filling every core I can get my hands on is a great idea, but it's not. In fact, Dependent on your choice of K space and K point distribution, right, in space, I actually might want to have a different set of core choices. And that, by the way, brings me to my final thing before I go on, which is that structures such as things like metal oxides, right, or mineral, let's just do a metal oxide, base metal oxide. Uh, let's do iron oxide, right, such as this. I can actually look at um, understanding, um, you know, Brion zones. I can create a Brion zone path, which helps me when I'm setting up my reciprocal space definition for an inorganic material to know what are the G, where is my H vector, where is my L vector, how does that relate to my lattice, and, and obviously I'm able to display three-dimensional periodic lattices, and I'm able to scale those, and I'm able to change the number of lattices and number of lattice repeats that I see, so I can start to increase that to two, to three by three. Right. And so it has that capability as well as in the same interface, building polymers, building surfaces, building layers, modifying symmetry, and driving a whole range of quantum codes. The third important aspect is that if people have the need to connect to external servers, we can actually invoke the Excelis platform, which is called Pipeline Pilot, and that allows us to connect to a whole range of different computational methods and different tools. So, for example, here uh, I can look at my data modeling, I can look at my analyses, I can look at my polymer properties. All of those can be run through my external engine as well. So that was a very long answer to a simple question. Uh, but yes, we can go through this in more detail, and we can go through it in by theme, quantum, atomistic, meso, statistical spectroscopic. Um, we have another question, uh, and it reads, I am, in, I am interested in organic electronics and its application on display and photovoltaic application, uh -huh. and I would like to simulate them. Where should I start to study the modeling and simulation for that kind of area? 
those systems start in two different areas. The first area is is understanding an organic like my anthracene, right, or my double aromatic ring here, and its spectroscopic properties and the consequence of things like the electron distribution and charge distribution and homo homo minus high occupied molecular orbital minus one minus two minus three minus four and unoccupied molecular orbitals or virtual orbitals. The second is you start to do things like building surfaces, right? Where you take a material, right? where I go in and I build a surface material. Right, so build a let me just get my up. There we go. Build a surface. And from that I can cleave a an arbitrary surface, just pick a block diagonal surface. Right? Right, and what that does is to allow us to construct different surfaces and different parts to a surface. The other aspect of that uh, might be that I just bring up my simulation where that builds um, is um, is to read in a surface. So there are different ways of doing it. Let me just quickly. Bring up the material. Right? So this project, where I've got a lot of calculations that I've done and a lot of values, I'm going to import into this just an arbitrary surface. Uh, build my other surface. Sorry, don't worry. I'm just waiting for that. I'm trying to keep it short and sweet. So there's a surface. Now I have a surface. I can do extensions on it. So for example. I can take it out in UV space, three by three, right? I can now build that as a crystal, right? What is called a vacuum slab, which is an area. So this is just the approach that you do, right? And basically, what I've now done is to build a surface layer, right? And then I can grab my atomistic calculation from there. And grab that whole molecule, which I just displaced off the origin. Copy, go back to my surface, and paste it in. Right, and so now I can start to look at a structured um, material on the surface. Right, and I can in fact paste another layer in, and very rapidly within a few seconds, I'm starting to construct hypothetical arrangements. And now you're going to ask me a question such as, well, what happens, you know, if I if I rotate these, right? And I'm rotating all the symmetry equivalents. And how does that affect uh, my charge distribution? And those are research questions. And obviously, once I have this, I'm going to then do a density functional a force field relaxation calculation. I might freeze the surface, look at the relaxation of the molecules over that, with or without symmetry, depending on what the focus of my study is. And then I might start to look at the electronic and hence the spectral consequences of that modification. Hopefully that answers the question. I'll give you at least some pointers to it. Modules I used, reading in crystal lattices, surface building, quantum mechanics at both, and maybe a force field calculation. Um, so that would be using the builders over here, right? Building crystals and surfaces. And then from the computational modules, I would possibly relax it initially with a foresight calculation, a molecular mechanics spring calculation, preserving symmetry. And then I might move into a density functional periodic DFT calculation. Okay. Those are icons are meant to be you know, representative of the sort of calculation you're doing. So um, it's, it's a little hard, but, but if you can see them on the screen, this is supposed to be a set of springs with little symmetry designators between them. It's a little hard to see, but once you see the software, you will. And over here, this is supposed to be a set of orbitals, and FAMP is supposed to be a set of molecular charges because FAMP isn't periodic, whereas DMOL actually allows us to do periodic. Okay? Any more questions? Yeah, we'll take one more question. 
And yeah, so we, we have one more question. That is, what's the learning curve for Material Studio? Actually, it's, um, there are two sets of learning curves, right? There's product orientation. What I mean by that is knowing where things are in the interface. And that's a couple of days, right? There are a set of tutorials built into the software here under the help text, um, which allow us uh, to go through, to drill through all of the functions. There's an index, as you see here, I'm scrolling down onto it, right? And I can dig into that list of tutorials, right, uh, for, let's say, Humera, right? And it will take me through a whole exercise in doing a calculation and what it is, as you see here inside the help text, settings that need to be done. What's also interesting is that I can dig into methods. And so the second level of training or understanding is theory, right? It's not just um, where are the buttons to push, it's what happens behind those buttons. And what we do in that sense is for some of this technology, not, not, not exhaustive because, you know, uh, there are many, many, many very good textbooks on this and, and, and guidance from, from, from professors and things like that. But, for example, um, we have the ability to understand what, what is a pseudo-potential with hyperlinks here, as you see, to references to understand what is a numerical basis set and what electron levels are incorporated into this. Why is numerical integration rather than a functional form integration uh, the approach that is used to give you speed in, in DMOL calculations, right? And then down to what is self-consistency, what is the method used to do that, and how do you evaluate things like energy gradients and the formula. So Material Studio has a whole series of help and um, self-teaching capabilities built into it. You can save your favorites as an individual user. There's a search, so if I'm interested in surface, right, it will go out and find me everything which mentions surfaces and what they are, and I can search for them. There's an index you can manually go through, and then there's a table of contents done like a, a detentable list. Right, which shows you things like building tools, polymer builders, analog builders, nanostructure builders, which is a very cool. And that's one last thing I would I'd be remiss if I didn't show you. Right, so if I just go back into my system and uh, create a new element, right, I have a tool for building nanostructures. Just simple thing, simple things like nano, single nano wall tubes. Right, I wanted to be able to build a six six non periodic. Six repeats, right? Six, six, six. There you go. Um, it's just constructed, just like that. If I want to change the offset value, notice that the length changes dramatically because of the, the spiral effects, right? There's my offset. Now I'm creating a handed or chiral nanotube. That's a trivial one. More complex is I can start to build multiple nanotubes where I don't bother minimizing it because it'll just take time. I'm going to build a 6-7. I'm going to build two repeats and three walls. And just double that one more. And hit build. And that goes away and constructs. It takes a second. It's nearly complete. Here it comes. Right, and there's my three nano walls. And if I just zoom out slightly to give you a view on that, right, now I have my structure. And then I can do things that are penis in a scientific sense, but I can start to look at defects, right? I can play Pac-Man with this. And that's very important. Or I can do this and do atom substitution and random percentage substitution, right? But it is very, very capable. So those are builders, those are part of all of the builders in the in the core interface uh, that the system has. Um, we have one last question, and it reads, can we create a helical nanotube such as a spring type? Yes, you can. Um, it's not a, a push-button operation, but one of the things that Material Studio has within it 
all right, um, is is the area of scripting, all right? And so that's silly. Uh, okay, so and Material Studio allows us to do uh, script. And there's a thing called uh, a language called Material Studio Script, and there's a full API, right, that allows us to go through and uh, modify that and to connect to it, and it actually covers a, a range of different um, requirements. So this is the application program interface to Material Studio and it allows you to address all of the atomistic structural documents, absorption locators, all of the modules, and allows us to look at atom creation, layer building, modification, symmetry building. So just to show you that, um, if I create a new element, right, I can actually bring into this a script, right? Um, so let's just go here, go here, go here. Say I want to see all of the files, sort them by name, right? And I'm going to run a script called the Atomic Clock, which is a little bit of tongue-in-cheek science, right? And these are all the structures I have up, which I can just save, right? So what I'm going to do is just close all the windows so it's all nice and clean for everybody, right? Let's save all those and reopen Atomic Clock, right? So there's the Atomic Clock script. My script runner is enabled. What this does is to build an atomic clock, right? So that's the joke here. That now I have a set of silicon atoms I've positioned around it. The time here is about 11.17 in California. And it's positioned a double bond, oxygen and hydrogen bond. It's positioned what is a non-bond with a dummy atom that's actually invisible here. And it's running the script repeatedly to create a clock. Why did I say this? Well, because using this, I can build spirals, structures. I can take a tube and torque it by displacing the top and the bottom in any arbitrary vector or through any force constant I want. Right? That is the nature of material script. It allows us, if I just stop this script, do I want to stop running the script? Yes. Right. It allows us, as you can see, to add atoms and to create atoms and bonds in an arbitrary geometric pattern. And so originally there was a lot of work done at NASA about building hypothetical gear rings and gear structures and nanos. And a lot of those were done using scripts that basically said, put an atom, rotate around a central point, move it forward, move it up, place another atom, etc., etc. And that's how you build some of these large, complex, hypothetical nanostructured or nano patterned systems. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the wonderful presentation and for answering all our questions. And thank you all, all uh, for listening into this webinar. Due to lack of time, we will get back to some of your questions via email. Uh, to find out more about our uh, webinars and workshops, you can log into our website, that is lns.umesh.edu slash nnin-ata-michigan. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, have a nice day. Thanks, everyone.